Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and I'm back today at the Naval Museum of Manitoba having a look at yet another fascinating piece of naval rescue technology. This is a Taukretter or dive rescuer and this is the World War II German version of a type of equipment known as an escape set which as the name implies is designed to allow a submariner to escape a sinking submarine. Now, these were developed in the early 20th century, just as modern combat submarines were starting to enter service and were used until the end of the Second World War, though a couple of models, as we'll see, continued in service well into the 1960s. Now, before we get into the particular mechanics and history of escape sets themselves, I first want to have a look at the technology that underpins these devices. And I think you'll be quite surprised to find out how sophisticated this is and that this type of equipment actually predates the much simpler but more familiar self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, or SCUBA, by more than half a century. So escape sets by and large used variations on the rebreather principle. So this is a type of closed circuit breathing apparatus as opposed to the open circuit system used in SCUBA. And this is based on the fact that when you breathe in air, your body doesn't absorb all the oxygen in that air. So while air at sea level contains around 21% oxygen, exhaled air contains between 13 to 16% oxygen plus nitrogen and carbon dioxide produced by the body's metabolism. Now 13 to 16% oxygen under regular conditions is more than enough to sustain life. And indeed, this is the basis for CPR and other rescue breathing techniques. If you breathe air into the lungs of somebody who has stopped breathing on their own, that can sustain them until they actually start breathing on their own. It also theoretically means that you can rebreathe the same lung full of air several times before the oxygen becomes depleted. However, in practice, you quickly run into a major problem, which is the buildup of carbon dioxide. Now, the urge to breathe, that burning sensation that you feel when you try to hold your breath, isn't actually caused by a lack of oxygen. Indeed, when you suffer from hypoxia, a lack of oxygen, you simply become disoriented and pass out. It's been described as quite peaceful. Rather, that urge to breathe, that burning sensation, comes from the buildup of carbon dioxide in the bloodstream and the lungs. And so if you try to rebreathe the same air over and over again, the carbon dioxide concentration is going to gradually increase and the air will quickly become unbreathable. And if you continue trying to breathe it despite the pain, uh, you will start suffering from carbon dioxide poisoning, passing out, and eventually dying. However, if you can somehow filter out that carbon dioxide, then you can indeed rebreathe the same air several times. And this is the principle behind a rebreather. So in a rebreather, you breathe a breathing gas, which in older versions tended to be pure oxygen, and later versions, a nitrogen oxygen mixture known as nitrox, and we'll go into the reasons for that later. And then when you exhale, your breath is then passed through what's known as a scrubber, which is a canister filled with a chemical that absorbs carbon dioxide. This air, now scrubbed of carbon dioxide, is then recycled and rebreathed with a little bit of gas from the tank being added to top up the oxygen level. So there are several advantages to a rebreather system, the main ones being longevity and compactness. So in an open circuit breathing system like SCUBA, you are breathing in the breathing gas and exhaling it out into the environment, meaning that you're wasting a lot of that unabsorbed oxygen. In a rebreather, however, you are recycling the same breathing gas over and over again, allowing you to get more bang for your buck, so to speak, out of the same volume of breathing gas. And so either you can have a piece of equipment that's about the same as an open cycle circuit, but that can last you hours and hours, or you can have a much more compact unit with a much smaller bottle of breathing gas that is much more convenient for use in confined areas, say in a submarine, in firefighting, mine rescue, etc. There's also the side benefit that these units by and large don't produce any bubbles. And this is especially useful, say, if you are a combat diver, because the bubbles will give away your position if you're trying to infiltrate, say, an enemy naval base, or if you're an underwater photographer, because the bubbles could frighten the ocean life that you are trying to photograph. So the key component in any rebreather is, of course, the carbon dioxide scrubber. And a number of chemicals have been used throughout history for this purpose. 
mainly various metal oxides and hydroxides. So for example, barium, potassium, lithium, and sodium hydroxide, or calcium oxide, aka quicklime, and its hydroxide, aka slaked lime. Though this particular scrubber suffers from a number of disadvantages, mainly that if it mixes with water, it will react exothermically, producing a great amount of heat, which could potentially lead to lung burns for the user. Also, the hydroxide is a far less efficient carbon dioxide scrubber than the oxide, uh, making the whole system far less effective. And finally, there is a particularly interesting scrubber known as Oxylith, which was invented by Georges Jobin in 1907. And this consists of sodium peroxide or superoxide, and it has the unique property of releasing oxygen when it absorbs carbon dioxide, allowing the rebreather that uses it to be a lot more compact and efficient. Now, the first rebreather, as we would recognize it today, was invented in 1808 by a French naval engineer named Pierre-Marie Touboulic. And his design consisted of a copper tank full of pressurized oxygen and a scrubber consisting of a sponge soaked in a sodium hydroxide solution. So very similar in design to modern rebreathers. However, there is no evidence they actually ever built a prototype. It was merely a paper design. So the invention of the practical rebreather is usually attributed to one Henry Floyce, who was an engineer at the London-based Sieb Gorman Company. And he first came up with his design in 1878. And just like Tubulix, it consisted of a pressurized tank of gas, in this case a 60-40 mixture of oxygen and nitrogen, rather than pure oxygen, and a scrubber consisting of rope yarn soaked in sodium hydroxide. Now, the following year, in 1879, he conducted the first man tests of a rebreather. First, by spending an hour underwater in the test tank at Sieb Gorman, and later by diving to a depth of 5.5 meters in the open ocean. And the following year, 1880, saw the first practical industrial use of a rebreather. And this was during the construction of the Severn Railway Tunnel. And in order to drain the tunnel and complete the work, a number of sluice gates had to be closed, and these were located in 300 meters of darkness underwater at the end of the tunnel. And attempts to carry out this task using divers in standard diving dress, the old suits with the big copper helmets, failed because of the danger of the air hoses becoming tangled in obstacles. However, the lead diver, using one of Floyce's rebreathers, was easily able to complete the task. And in that same year, a surface version of this rebreather was used to inspect a coal mine after a gas explosion. And in the years that followed, Sieb Gorman would produce a number of different models of rebreathers, mostly as industrial breathing sets for use in, say, firefighting or mine rescue, including the Salvus and the Proto. And these would see a rather interesting use during the First World War. So one of the big forgotten fields of combat during the First World War was the so-called tunneling or mining war, where engineers from both sides would attempt to tunnel under no man's land and plant large charges of explosives or mines under enemy lines. These would be detonated just before an attack in order to wipe out enemy defenses. Now, in addition to mining, tunnelers were also engaged in the practice of countermining, whereby they would try to locate and intercept enemy tunnels, typically using sound, and destroy them. And this led to fierce and savage underground battles with firearms, with knives and clubs in pitch darkness, as well as the destruction of tunnels using small explosive charges called camouflets. And when one of these charges went off, it would create a lot of toxic gas that would fill the tunnel, and so rescuers would have to go in with some sort of breathing device. And these were typically Sieb Gorman protos. Meanwhile, in Germany, the Dreger company of Lübeck was producing very similar rebreather equipment, both for diving and as industrial breathing sets. And in 1907, they produced the world's first purpose-built submarine escape set, known as the u boot Retter, or submarine rescuer. And further development of this technology was spurred by a disaster that occurred on January 17th 
1911, when the submarine U-3 accidentally sank off the coast of Kiel when water infiltrated a poorly fitted ventilation stack. And although the German Navy tried desperately to winch the submarine to the surface, they could not do so in time to prevent the entire crew from suffocating. And so later in 1916, the German Navy officially adopted a Dreger-designed escape set under the designation DM-2. And this underwent further development between the wars until 1940, when we get the finalized Taukretter, or dive rescuer. Now a little bit of fun linguistics for you here. Originally in German, the term Tauken didn't exclusively refer to diving in water. It meant to be immersed in an unbreathable atmosphere. And so one of the colloquial German terms for a firefighter was Feuertaucher, or flame diver, which is kind of badass. Although by the mid 20th century, the term had narrowed and referred to simply diving in water. Right, so let's actually have a closer look at this Taukreiter to see how it works. Now, as you can see, this is designed very much like an inflatable life preserver. It is worn over the neck on the front of the body, and there is a crotch strap that fits between the legs to stop the unit from falling off and floating away. And all of the major components are contained inside this rubberized canvas bag that is sealed with this metal clamp at the bottom. Now, I'd love to remove this, open up the bag, and show you the components inside, but unfortunately, as I said, this is made out of rubberized canvas. This is a material that tends to get very brittle with age, and if I were to release this clamp here, I would risk damaging the artifact. Now, since I don't want to do that, I'm going to rely on photos of other units in other collections to show what these components looked like. Now, this bag here served two different functions. One is as a Gegenlunge, or a counter lung, and this serves the same function as the regulator valve in a scuba set, which is to pre-charge the breathing gas to the pressure of the ambient environment, counterbalancing that pressure and allowing that breathing gas to be more easily breathed. It also serves as a buoyancy aid, which allows the submariner, when exiting the submarine, to rise to the surface without expending any energy, and keeps him afloat when he is on the surface. Now at the bottom of the counter lung here is a small cylinder of oxygen. And as you can see from this photograph, most of them were very boldly marked with big gothic letters, Sauerstoff, which is the German word for oxygen. Now, if I might take another fun detour into linguistics, that term is a direct copy of the original French word oxygène, which literally means acid generator. You see, early chemists falsely believed that oxygen was a key component of all acids. We now know that this isn't true, that the key component of acids is actually hydrogen, but the name stuck. And so in German, you have sour, so sour, as in vinegar or other acids, and stoff, the generic term for substance, so sour substance or acid substance, oxygen. So that oxygen cylinder was connected to this valve here, which would feed the oxygen into the counter lung. Now this is one way in which early rebreathers differ significantly from modern diving equipment. Now there's no sort of demand valve here that would provide you with exactly the amount of breathing gas you need, depending on how deeply you breathed in. Rather, you had to continuously and manually adjust the flow of oxygen into the counter lung in order to give you the amount of breathing gas that you needed. Now, from the counter lung, the oxygen would go up through this hose here to this mouthpiece. And at the top of the mouthpiece here, we have a little lanyard, and this would be connected to a nose clip. That would keep your nose closed in order to prevent you from accidentally breathing in water. And this is because the goggles that were issued with this equipment, known as Taukenbrille, didn't have any sort of nose piece to block off the nostrils. You also have a little cutoff valve here on the mouthpiece, and this serves two different functions. First, when you get to the surface and you want to use this as a life preserver, you don't want air leaking out of it, so you would close off this valve, and that would retain the gas inside the counter lung. Uh, secondly, as I said before, the scrubbing material in here tends to react rather violently with water, and so when it wasn't being used, the mouthpiece would be closed off to prevent water from leaking in and reacting with the scrubber. Now when the user breathed out, the exhaled air would go back down through the same breathing tube and back through the scrubber canister, the alkali patron, which would scrub out all the carbon dioxide. 
And this arrangement where the breathing gas goes in both directions through the scrubber canister is known as a pendulum rebreather. There are different forms of rebreathers that have one directional flow. You'll actually have two breathing tubes. One is for the oxygen rich breathing gas and the other is for the exhaled gas. And it has one way valves to ensure that the gas only flows in one direction through the scrubber canister. And both have their advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of the pendulum system being that it's just simpler and easier to construct. Now the last component worth pointing out is this little relief valve here. And this is to release excess pressure to compensate for the expansion of the counter lung as the user ascends. So if this wasn't in place, as you ascended and the pressure dropped, the counter lung would just continuously expand until it finally ruptured. Now this actually features a little clamp here. This is for use on the surface. This serves the same purpose as the cutoff valve on the mouthpiece. So when you're on the surface and using this as a life preserver, you don't want any of the breathing gas to leak out. So you flip this clamp up and it closes off the relief valve. Now something worth noting is one of the fundamental dangers of using this type of equipment. And that danger has to do with the use of pure oxygen as a breathing gas. Now, while oxygen is essential to human life, you can have too much of a good thing. And if you breathe oxygen at too high a pressure, it can become toxic. And this can lead to various nasty effects, including convulsions and eventually death. Now, this isn't much of a problem if you're escaping from a submarine at relatively shallow depths or using this as diving gear in shallow water. But if you're trying to escape from a submarine that has sunk below 20 meters, Oxygen toxicity is a very real hazard. Now, interestingly, according to the manual for the Tau Crater, there was a, an accepted technique for reducing this risk. And so what you would do is you would use the mouthpiece to suck all the air out of the counter lung, and then depending on what depth you were escaping from, you would pre-charge the counter lung with one to three breaths of air. And since you were in a submarine hull that was operating at atmospheric pressure with a regular nitrogen oxygen atmosphere, this would basically create your own nitrox mixture inside the counter lung. You would then top it up with oxygen and escape out through your escape hatch. And this would reduce the oxygen concentration enough to reduce the risk of oxygen toxicity by the time you got to the surface. Now later the problem of oxygen toxicity would be solved by modifying the Tau Kreter to accept a nitrox breathing gas system. And you find this in the post-war variants used by the Bundesmarine, the TR-60 and the TR-66. Now what's interesting is that the 1916 DM-2 uh, U-boat used during the First World War also had a nitrox system. This was later deleted for the sake of simplicity. Now, just to give you an idea of the increase in efficiency and endurance that a rebreather system gives you over open circuit scuba, if this cylinder contained only regular compressed air, it would give you breathing gas for only a couple of minutes. And indeed, many divers carry small bottles like this. They're known as bailout bottles or pony bottles for emergency situations. However, filled with pure oxygen and coupled with a rebreather system, this little cylinder can give you breathing gas for about a half hour, depending on your depth and depending on the amount to which you are exerting yourself. Now, this type of equipment was designed for use with a regular escape hatch or in more sophisticated submarines like those produced by the UK and the United States, an escape chamber or escape trunk. And this is a type of airlock with a hatch on the inside and a hatch on the outside that is capable of being filled with water and pumped dry. And the main advantage of using an escape trunk is it prevents you from having to flood an entire compartment in order to get the hatch open. Because even in fairly shallow water, the immense water pressure pressing down on the hatch makes it very difficult to open. So if you didn't have an escape trunk, you would have to flood the entire compartment in order to get the hatch open. And if you have a large number of sailors that are trying to escape, especially if some of them don't have escape gear, this is a recipe for disaster. So an escape trunk works by having one or more sailors enter the trunk through the inner hatch. The hatch is then closed, the chamber is flooded to equalize the pressure inside and outside, and then the hatch is opened and the sailors swim to the surface. 
Then the outer hatch is closed using a mechanism accessible from inside the submarine, then the chamber is drained, the inner hatch is open, and the whole cycle begins anew. Right, so before we move on, let's actually have a look at some of the variations in color and design that you'll find on these, as well as markings, just in case you become interested in collecting Tau craters for yourself. So early war patterns tended to have this dark yellow khaki color, whereas later war patterns tended to be made in this very distinctive rusty red brown canvas. They were also manufactured by two different companies, uh, Dreger as well as Euer, and those are distinguished by different manufacturer codes, usually stamped on the back flap, as you can see here. So the manufacturer code for Dreger was typically BWZ, and Euer was BYD. This one, however, you can see is marked PVZ. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any references indicating what that particular manufacturer code means, though my best guess is that it's an earlier war code for Dreger. Now, a training version of the Tau Kreter was also manufactured, known as the Klein Tau Gerät, and it differed from the service models only in that it had a smaller oxygen cylinder and a scrubber canister. And you'll also find transport bags for these, which are typically made out of this reddish-brown canvas uh, with padding on the inside to protect some of the more delicate components during transport and storage. Now, if you're thinking to yourself that these units look fairly familiar, that's because they feature prominently in the 1981 film Da's Boat. Now, in the film, they're not used for escaping from the submarine, but they are used as a sort of industrial breathing set, particularly by one member of the crew who goes into the battery compartment to make repairs, and he uses the Tau Kreiter to protect him from the chlorine gas being given off because seawater leaked into the battery cells. Now, they also use the scrubber canister separated from the Tau Kreiter units, along with the breathing hose and mouthpiece, in order to filter out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere when they are hiding on the bottom for extended periods of time. So if you haven't seen that movie in a while, go rewatch it. It's amazing. It's a certifiable classic. So Germany wasn't the only belligerent nation during the Second World War to make use of escape sets. Indeed, pretty much every navy that made extensive use of submarines had some variation on this type of equipment. For example, in 1910, a British engineer named Sir Robert Davis, who was a colleague of Henry Floyce at Sieb Gorman, created a submarine escape set, which in 1927 was officially adopted by the Royal Navy as the Davis Submerged Escape Apparatus, or DSEA, typically simply known as the Davis set. And in overall design, this was very similar to the Tauchretter, with a number of important differences. First, it had a breathing bag with extra horns on the sides that fit over the shoulders in order to increase its volume. It also had a secondary emergency buoyancy bag, and this was activated by reaching through the bag to a pair of little oxygen cylinders called oxalates and breaking off the neck of these in order to inflate the bag. And this gave you a couple of minutes of extra oxygen for breathing, as well as extra buoyancy once on the surface. Uh, the DSEA could also accept an external line from an external oxygen tank in order to keep the unit topped up with air prior to escape. This allowed you to conserve the oxygen that was in the built-in cylinder. And finally, the last interesting design detail of the DSEA was an extendable rubberized canvas apron that you could hold out in front of you. And this was to act as a drag brake in order to slow your rate of ascent. And there's two different reasons why you'd want to do this. One is to reduce the risk of decompression sickness, or the bends. This occurs when you surface too quickly, you decompress too quickly, and nitrogen that is built up in your body comes out of solution and forms tiny bubbles that can lead to joint pain and embolisms and various other nasty effects. However, this is really less of a concern when escaping from a sunken submarine for a number of reasons. Number one, you are escaping from a submarine that is not pressurized, it is maintained at regular sea level atmospheric pressure. And you're only being exposed to the pressure of the ocean for a very brief period of time, not enough for a lot of nitrogen to become dissolved in your body. Secondly, you are breathing pure oxygen, which tends to flush nitrogen out of your system, further reducing the risk of decompression sickness. 
So the main reason for wanting to reduce your rate of ascent was to reduce barotrauma. And this is an injury that can occur if you ascend too quickly with air in your lungs. It causes the air in your lungs to expand and damage your lungs. And so this is why when using equipment like this, and indeed when engaging in any sort of diving, they teach you this over and over again in diving school, you do not hold your breath. You're always continuously breathing. Even if you don't have access to any sort of breathing gas, you breathe out continuously, especially if you are ascending. Now, interestingly, DSEAs were used as far more than simply submarine escape sets. For example, they were briefly issued to crews of duplex drive tanks. These were amphibious tanks designed for the D-Day operations. They had a big canvas screen around them to make them buoyant and a set of propellers attached to the main drivetrain. Now, as you can imagine, if anything goes wrong with one of these, they will sink like a stone. So the crews were issued with DSEAs to allow them time to escape the sinking tank. However, the original naval version was found to be too bulky to fit through a tank hatch, and so a more compact version known as the amphibious tank escape apparatus was issued instead. Now, like a lot of early rebreathers, DSEAs were also modified for use by combat divers, or frogmen. And this was a use that was pioneered by the Italians, who set up a special unit known as the Decima MAS, who used men torpedoes known as maiale, or pigs, to conduct a number of daring raids on British shipping in harbors such as Alexandria, Malta, and Gibraltar in the Mediterranean. And this technology was immediately copied by the British, who produced their own manned torpedo called the Chariot, as well as a midget submarine called the X-Craft. And along with divers equipped with uh, dry suits known as Sladen suits, and a modified DSEA conducted a number of successful raids themselves. The Germans also made limited use of combat divers at the end of the war, particularly to blow up bridges, docks, and other infrastructure ahead of the advancing allies. Yet despite these various successes, rebreathers of the era were fairly limited, especially in the depth that they could reach, due to the danger of oxygen toxicity, which is why later models for combat swimmers typically integrated a nitrox system to solve this problem. So hopping briefly across the pond, during this period the US Navy also had its own submarine escape set, which was known as the Momsen Lung, after its inventor, Lieutenant Charles Swede Momsen. Now Momsen developed a wide variety of submarine rescue equipment, the most famous of which was probably the McCann Rescue Chamber, which was a type of diving bell famously used in 1939 to rescue the crew of the USS Squalus, which had accidentally sunk during diving trials. Now, the Momsen lung was very similar to the other types of escape sets that we've looked at in this video, only rather than having a simple pendulum breathing system, it had a loop breathing system, where it had two hoses connected to the mouthpiece and a number of one-way valves to ensure that the breathing gas only flowed in one direction through the carbon dioxide scrubber. So the question you're probably asking now is, did these actually work? Did many sailors actually manage to escape from submarines using submarine escape sets? And the answer is no, not really. Although the reason for this is because submarine sinkings tend to be very quick affairs. If you're hit by a depth charge or a torpedo and you quickly flood, most sailors aren't going to have the time to even find an escape hatch, let alone don and activate their escape sets. And so there really weren't many opportunities for these to be used. Indeed, in the history of the Royal Navy, there are only three recorded instances of the Davis submerged escape apparatus being used operationally. The sinking of HMS Poseidon in 1929, sinking of HMS Thetis in 1939, and the sinking of HMS Perseus in 1941. If you want to learn about the sinking of HMS Thetis, which is a horrifying comedy of errors, please check out my video on the subject over on the channel Highlight History, link in the description. And in the history of the U.S. Navy, there was only one recorded use of the Momsen Lung, which was during the sinking of the USS Tang in 1944, after it sank itself with a circular running torpedo. And in many cases, it is believed that these sets actually killed more sailors than they saved, because in a panic, sailors wouldn't breathe correctly, they would hold their breath, and they would suffer from fatal barotrauma while ascending to the surface. And for this reason, after the war, many navies reconsidered the use of escape sets and tried developing alternate methods for escaping a submarine. 
And in the Royal Navy and the US Navy, one of the techniques adopted was known as blow and go or buoyant ascent. And this didn't require any special equipment other than a life preserver. And the idea was to fill your lungs, exit the submarine, and continuously exhale as you surface to prevent your lungs from overexpanding and suffering barotrauma. And indeed, a variation of this technique is still taught in scuba diving classes today for making an emergency ascent from the bottom. However, in 1963, the US Navy did adopt a new type of personal submarine escape equipment known as the Steinke Hood, named after its inventor, Lieutenant Harris Steinke. And this is considerably simpler than the earlier Momsen Lung and other escape sets in that it didn't have its own air supply or any sort of carbon dioxide filtering system. Rather, it consisted of an inflatable life preserver fitted with a flexible sealed hood with a clear plastic window. And the relief valves on the life preserver vented directly into the hood. So you would pre-charge this with compressed air from the submarine, enter the escape trunk, and then float to the surface. And as the pressure reduced and as the life preserver expanded, the excess pressure would be vented into the hood, providing a continuous flow of breathing gas until you reached the surface. And once you did reach the surface, you had a snorkel valve with a mouthpiece that you could breathe through to prevent carbon dioxide from accumulating inside the hood. And the idea behind this design was that submariners really didn't need a sophisticated rebreather system like the Momsen Lung simply to escape a sinking submarine. All they needed was a relatively small volume of air, enough to sustain them for the relatively short time it took to reach the surface. And also, this was a lot easier to use than the blow-and-go technique because the sailor didn't have to exercise any sort of breathing discipline. He could breathe normally as he ascended to the surface. And the Steinke Hood remained in service for a remarkably long time, not being retired until 2009 when it was replaced by a piece of kit called Submarine Escape Immersion Equipment, or SEIE, i.e. one of these. So this type of escape equipment was invented in 1952 by a British company called RFD Beaufort Limited, and this is essentially an expanded version of the Steinke Hood that envelops the entire body. So you would get into this, seal it shut, charge it with air, enter the escape trunk, and then float to the surface. And this would give you just enough air to make the journey. And then once you're on the surface, this provides much more protection than the Steinke hood, which just covers the head. This is a full cold water immersion suit that includes an integrated inflatable life raft, as well as pockets containing emergency equipment like rations. And so once you have escaped the submarine, you have a much greater chance of surviving, especially in cold water, with this type of equipment. And so in 2009, the US Navy replaced its Steinke hoods with the Mark 10 version of this equipment, and they're now on to the Mark 11 version. But while that is the current state of the art of submarine escape equipment, that's not the end of the rebreather story. Indeed, over the last 80 years, rebreather technology has been continuously improved to the point where it is now extremely sophisticated, with modern rebreathers integrating computerized technology to continuously monitor and adjust the levels of breathing gases in order to enhance the diver's safety and to achieve increased endurance. And these types of rebreathers are used, for example, for cave diving and combat diving and pretty much any other application where you would need to dive for an extended period of time or dive stealthily with no bubbles to give you away. But that technology is far beyond the scope of this video, so that will have to wait until a later date. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching and a huge thank you to the Naval Museum of Manitoba for allowing me to go through their collection and cover fascinating items like this. I hope to do a lot more filming with them in the near future, so please stay tuned for that. Until next time, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.